And uh, looks like we're live. So hello and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy and More with your host, John Henry Sheridan. Today, I have a very fun special guest, an old uh, friend and former teacher, um, Melissa Morris. Welcome, Melissa. Hi there. I'm just going to yes. start though, John. I don't like the word old. <laughs> I know. I, as it came out, I'm like old. I'm like, uh oh. Uh. <laughs> that's like friend. Okay, that, that sounds good. <laughs> long time? Come out. Long right. Time. Yeah, long time. That would have been more, you know, it would have been a better choice of words for sure. Okay. Yeah. I but no, be. no, not, not old at all. And certainly young, young at heart for sure. I try to keep it that way. Yeah. No, it, it's for real. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, uh, so, so you and I met, you were saying about uh, 1997, is that when you definitely started up at Madison? 1996 is when I started, September 96. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But the guitar program didn't actually start until 97. And that's when you and I hooked up because you were a guitar guy, right? Mm -hmm. And I was opening this guitar program and I was being given the opportunity to start a guitar program. Oh, wow. That's how, yeah. Mm -hmm. Help me do it. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, uh, I remember hearing, we're going to have a guitar teacher here. I was like, Whoa, that's going to be, that's great. You know? <laughs> and then, then we met and, uh, you were all gung ho about it. And I was like, how can I help? And what can I learn from the process? And yeah. yeah. And then you opened my, uh, my eyes to, um, to classical guitar in a way that, I really wasn't aware of at that point. You opened my eyes up to some rock and roll and some really cool modes. You were like this mode guy. Yes, I was the mode guy for sure. That I'm learning this week. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I learned from you just as much as I think you learned from me. That was fun. Yeah, it was really cool. Thank you for that. Yeah, so uh, I'm sure we'll get into it and, and perhaps uh, we'll have some viewers who shared that time period together and, and you know, we'll take it from there. Um, but uh, if you're watching on the replay, I know Mike Mari, Mike and Mari will definitely watch the replay. Uh, you know, feel free to leave a comment, even if it's not live, and we'll, we'll check them out and get back to you, uh, you guys out there. So I'm going to start up asking uh, Melissa some questions. Um, <clears throat> and these are questions that I don't know the answer to. Primarily, you know, I, I have to say I was happy when I was reading some of the stuff you shared with me regarding uh, your past and, and your journey. I was happy that I knew about some of it. So like it showed me that we were connected through these years. It wasn't just this thing that recently out of the blue. So I'm like, you know, I'm glad that we did watch each other's journey from a distance, you know, yeah, it's cool. I so can you remember what it was that got you into enjoying music in the first place? Like as a fan, or what was your, some of your earliest inspirations? Well, I think for that, I have to go all the way back to elementary school. Hmm. Cause I remember, I don't know if this was your experience but I certainly know it's a very big experience especially in the New York City Department of Education. And I did go to, to school in Connecticut and they prepped us for this particular uh, test, if you will. Um, so if you wanted to be in the music program in elementary school, you had to pass a written test. Really? And I, my mother will tell you, um, or anybody who asks, that ever since she can remember, I was always with an instrument. I was always with the drum. I was always banging on stuff. I was my my first instrument that I remember, I recall, besides the piano that was always standard in my grandmother's house, was a guitar that my grandparents bought me. And it was like a sunburst and had the F holes in it. And I was must have been seven years old-ish. Mm -hmm. And it had this big triangle pick, you know, like cow. Oh, I remember those. Yeah. <laughs> So ever since I was little, I had instruments that always drew my attention. 
And when it was time for um, in elementary school for us to get into the music department, we had to pass this written test. And I, my mother will tell you that I was just stressing that I had to pass this test. I just had to pass this test. I please just had to pass this test. Now, if you know anything about me, you know, I'm not a test taker. Right? <laughs> I'm sharing this now out with the world, <laughs> not a test taker. So this caused me a lot of anxiety. And um, when I passed this test, I was astounded. And then it goes to, okay, all the people who passed the test now go to the auditorium and they call you down. And now they're gonna assign you these instruments. Wow. Well, they ask you for three choices, okay? Guitar is not one of them because it's the band. It's mm -hmm. not the orchestra or the band, it's the band. So they gave you three choices. I picked the drums as my first choice, the clarinet only because my older sister played the clarinet and this, I knew that instrument, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I picked the flute only because I think, because I knew that instrument, the rest of the instruments, I knew the guitar, I knew the piano, but those weren't options. Right. So I go, it's now my turn. I get called up and I go to the, the band director and he says, well, what's your first choice? I said, drums. He goes, nope, I got too many drummers. <laughs> I go, oh. I remember like the pit in my stomach at this point in time because I really just want the drums. Okay, my sister plays the clarinet. So how about the clarinet? He goes, let me see your teeth. So really? teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kaspari is his name, by the way, and he's still alive and he's still in Staten Island. So if he's oh, listening. <laughs> Um, he was great, though. Uh, I really enjoyed Mr. Kasparri, but I did not enjoy this experience, Mr. Kasparri. Um, no, you can't play the clarinet. You'll get buck teeth. Wow. <laughs> okay, so now I'm down to my last choice, and I'm, I'm afraid that if, if I don't get my top three choices, I don't get any, right? Mm. So now I'm like back into that anxious time again, where all I've ever really wanted to do since I, I can remember is be in the band, right? So then I, he hands me the, the head joint of the flute and he says, okay, make a sound. <laughs> I don't know how to make a sound. He goes, puff up your lips and just blow. So now I'm like, I can't make a sound on the flute. He goes, you're gonna play the trumpet. And I'm like, what's the trumpet? He shows me this trumpet. And the only the reference I have in my head is Dizzy Gillespie. And you when I say Dizzy age? Gillespie, <laughs> What? You knew him at that age? Was this like seven years old? Is this right? I remember not his name, but I remember a picture of him. With the big cheeks? With or was, was that that one? <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> now, in my four, fourth grade mind, I'm like, but I don't want to be looking like that big <laughs> cheeks. Right. So I was like distraught. I came home disappointed that I got this trumpet. Now he gave me this beautiful, shiny, silver Yamaha trumpet. And when I came home, my mother and my father, they were so excited for me. I was like, oh, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> right? Anyway, I learned the trumpet. I played trumpet all the way through middle school. Um, and my parents, they tell me that I was really good and I had private lessons and all of this stuff and I practiced according to them. I don't remember an ounce of practicing. I don't even remember being any good at it. <laughs> right. I remember middle school when I started to notice boys having a crush on a trumpet player. <laughs> That's all about I remember. Mm. Wow. So in high school, I dropped the trumpet. Like enough of this thing. It does not feed my soul. Mm -hmm. And I thought that now is the end of my music. Really? In high school? In high school. They stick you in, you know, in high school in the New York City Department of Education, you must have a music credit to graduate. You mm. know this, right? So I vaguely remember, yeah. Well, it wasn't a, it wasn't a challenge for you because you <laughs> wanted it, right? Yeah. Um, but now I'm in this new high school and I have to have a music credit or right, just give me general music. So I'm sitting in this general music class, 50 kids with a book. And as I'm learning from our teacher, who is a nice guy, this is not music. This is mm -hmm. just not music. Even mm -hmm. to this day, music to me, if I, if, when I have, 
if I ever have to teach music again in a, in a school that does not have instrumental music, I will not, I refuse. I will quit. <laughs> so I, um, the guitar teacher now comes into my general music class and he says, well, who wants to take guitar? Cause I got spots in my guitar class. Looks like Mr. Berger, you have a ton of people in this, in this class. Can I take a few? And I'm like, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so I go to guitar. And from there, I, I started two weeks late. So I had a little bit of catching up to do. And I couldn't figure out, I knew how to read music, but I didn't know the, the fingerboard, you know, like to make heads or tails of the fingerboard. It's not sure. really like the trumpet. You only no. get three valves, right? Totally different. So it took me about two weeks to decode that. <laughs> but once I decoded that, then I was off and running. So I started playing guitar when I was 14. Wow. Okay. Awesome. So b before you continue, let me uh, just say we got a Angelina Diaquino says, yes, trumpet. Uh, I guess she's a trumpet fan. You got a comment. Uh, nice. <clears throat> I didn't know the trumpet connection. Um, I say connection because I also played trumpet and, and, and James Madison, you may remember. So yeah, we had that similar other instrument, the trumpet. Um, yeah, so so your your story was awesome, and thank you for sharing it uh, in very vivid detail. I could see it, and uh, and it seemed mostly about how you uh, approach music through through the school or through like uh, with reading and kind of formal. Uh, do you have other memories of like listening to the Beatles with your parents or something outside of it, or not so much? Well, yeah, for sure. Uh, music was always on the on the radio. Um, and well, we're going to go, I'm going to really date myself, but we'd go back to solid gold. We'd have solid gold, you know, dinner theater, <laughs> solid <laughs> dinner theater, solid gold. I don't know if you remember John, cause this might be before your time, but it was a, it was a place where people, they played live, but on TV, you know, they mm -hmm. were, Dionne Warwick was the, the host. And Dion Warwick actually went to my high school, my college. She was oh, yeah. one of the stars at, at Heart School Music. Um, and, um, you know, it was always, always in the car. We'd always be listening to the to doo-wop or, or the Beatles or the Grateful Dead. My dad was a big Grateful Dead, Paul Simon fan. Yes, yeah, so we always had music, always, always in my life. My both my parents are creative. My mother is an artist, and my father is a graphic design, communications art, communication arts. So, um, the create the creative arts run thick in my family. So when hmm. I wanted to be a musician, it was not, it was not, um, it was not a bad thing. I know in some families, it's if you're not a doctor, you're not a lawyer, you're you know. If I when I said that I was going to go to school to be a musician they, you know, were ecstatic. They couldn't celebrate hard enough. Oh, wow. That, that's, uh, that's unique. I mean, there are those exceptional parents out there who truly support the arts, no questions asked, but I think many would say, you know, what's your backup plan or are you sure? Or, you know, that whole thing, right? right? That's great. Yeah, I was very supported when I told my mom. I mean, it was pretty clear to her that I wanted to do music. She was more interested in me doing music in like, go to school and, and learn stuff rather than just try to be a rock star. I ended up trying to do both, but at least she saw that I was taking her seriously enough to want to educate myself and teach and all that. Um, so cool. Uh, let me jump to the next question. So I don't know if this is a premature question, but uh, how would you describe the influence music has had on your life in the big picture? I mean, I'm sure you could go on and on about that, but just, you know, kind of rough picture of what that music is pretty much in, in, in encapsulates everything that I think about you know like you know driving even just driving from my house to the beach which is where I'm at right now um it's an hour and a half drive and I'm listening to music that was when I was a kid and my son is in this in the seat going oh my gosh you know like you know every single mm -hmm. lyric any any of the song for today i don't remember any of the lyrics right, right. maybe i'll 
I'll catch a um, a chorus for for music of, of of now. But from when I was growing up, even you know way far back, my from Paul Simon from my father's car from when I was you know eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I remember all the words. So really? wow. well, music does that to your memory, right? It, it, yeah. yeah it permeates and it, it's, it's there forever. Mm -hmm. um, but even like my dad died in, in June last year and after my, my father passed away, that guitar was my best friend, even still, like it's the thing that's getting me through. Yeah. So it, it's just, it's like, it's, it's not a child. I can't say it's like my son. It's 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 got its own place and its own permanent and critical critical piece of who I am and what I need to go from day to day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's great. I'm I'm curious what kind of this is a question I didn't plan. But I'm curious what kind of music you play when you just sit and kind of soothe your soul like I'm at I, are you working on a piece or are you just kind of playing from your heart or what was that um I I'm a classical player so it's what I know I've even from when I started 14 years old you know starting to get my fingers moving I picked up classical classical is kind of like the thing that that works for me uh, mm -hmm. so I pick up I, I actually picked up um, a bunch of pieces that were new to me, but had that melancholy, soothing, I don't know, comfort. Mm -hmm. You know, comfort for me. If I were to put it off on you, I don't know if you'd find it that that comforting, but com comforting for me. It's what, what works for me. Sure, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, music is... Uh... I, I remember, especially in high school days, I would wonder these kids who don't listen to music or play music, how do they, how do they get through the day? I had no idea, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little more open-minded to how that's possible now, but uh, when I was younger, I couldn't even picture it. Um, so it was fun to read about the, the reason you switched from being, well, I didn't get into asking you about when you chose to be a music performance major. So if you want to tell that story a bit, that's great. Also, um, and then how you switched from deciding to be a music performance major to a music education major. That was a fun story. Can you maybe fill us in on that, including a little bit about how you decided to be a performance major? I don't know if in, if in any of the stuff that you read, that you got the before, so high school to college, I didn't know if you, you, you ever got to read that I wanted to be a cop. No, I didn't. I think I left that out of some of the stuff. That, oh, yeah. But I, I think also, let me backtrack a minute. Remember when I said my parents celebrated like royally when I wanted to be a music major? Mm -hmm. Some of it might have had to do with the fact that they knew I wanted to be a police officer. Well, and that music would always be a part of my life because it always was, you know, like you don't just, you know, identify with music or, or soothe yourself with music from when you're itty bitty and then just cut it off because you're you know you're not in in school anymore playing because primarily through high school i think the only real thing that got me through high school with a smile was the fact that i had my guitar sitting you know on my couch mm -hmm. waiting for me to come home you know some days yeah um and and the guitar was like six hour commitment not because I had to, but because it was the thing that I wanted to do, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I was also really into community. So I think part of the reason why I loved the musical environment was it because it brought you together. It got, brought people together. Yep. Even when I would be sitting at my grandmother's house with that seven-year-old guitar and I'd be strumming with my big triangle pick, mm -hmm. <laughs> people would come in. Like, what is she doing with the guitar? What's she doing? Right, right. Like, it brings, it draws people in. So I enjoy collaborating. I enjoy community. And it's a really important part of my life. So when I was thinking about what I wanted to be when I grew up, 
a police officer to me in that moment or in that frame of mind was part of the community and it was it was a a, a, a symbol of i don't know in my head bringing community together doesn't seem to be that way right now <laughs> but in my 14 year old mind and in my 14 year old experience that's what police officers did mm -hmm. i wanted to be a police officer also know that i told you i was not a big test taker i didn't really enjoy academics in school i loved athletics it was a community i was mm -hmm. on a number of teams i loved music and i was in a number of musical performing groups in school all of those things were building community but when you went to history class there was no community there right when i went to math class yeah. there was no community there yeah. when i went to science it, i had maybe a lab partner but i refused to dissect <laughs> anything so i was not a really good community partner there um so school was not something i really looked forward to doing I took the police test, I passed, but my parents said, no child of mine, they have four daughters, no child of mine will not go to college. If you wanna be a police officer, Melissa, great. You'll do that after you graduate college. So I said, all right, if I gotta go to college, I'm going to music school because it's the only thing I love. Right. And then they applauded like, great, go to music school. Interesting. So in your mind, you were kind of willing to skip college and become a cop straight away? Yes. Interesting. Yeah, you would have been one spunky cop, I'm sure. I think, uh, uh, thankfully, when I got out of college, I saw the real life of a cop when my grandmother fell down the stairs and pronounced dead. And the police, the police were the first ones in. And I knew as I sat across from the very kind police officer, there was no way that I could do that mm -hmm. with anybody. Wow. Yeah, so the universe had another plan for you and uh, it's kind of spared you uh, from going in a direction that was not meant for you, I suppose. I agree with you. Um, so we got a hello from Ted Engelson. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Ted, how you doing? Thanks for joining. And he also said that aged guitars that are taken care of can have the most awesome sound. Hi, Melissa and John. So you were talking about that guitar with the F-holes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for sure. I do have at least one age guitar that I, I don't know if I take care of it, but it sounds good. <laughs> um, wow, cool. So, all right. So then you're, you're in college. You become a music major. Yep. Was that, was that a question when you joined me? Like, did you think about maybe music education in the beginning or you? No. No, music performance. I was a performance major. I got a, a scholar. My scholarship was to be a performance major. Um, and then, and I even said to my high school music teacher, there is no way I could ever be you. Like, look at all this teen <laughs> drama that you <laughs> Right now, it, I love the teen drama. And he loved the teen drama. And he would say, this is the best part of my job, the teen drama. Mm. And, um, I didn't see it from his perspective. I just saw it from my perspective as a teen, annoyed by all the teen drama, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Um, so how I became a music ed major was really kind of because my, my roommate in college was a music ed major. And she would come home with all these really cool assignments. And she'd walk through with a baritone. She was a horn player. She walked with a baritone. She walked in with us, you know, a cello one time. She walked in with a, a double reed instrument. She just kept walking in with these cool instruments and she'd spend time like trying to figure these things out. She, I was also her guinea pig when she was going on, um, this, um, you know, her field work. Mm -hmm. Hey, miss, sit down. I need you to be my, my kindergartner for a minute. <laughs> Tell me if this lesson is going to work. And this was all really exciting to me. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm stuck in my practice room for six hours, seven hours a day, trying to, you know, play my classical guitar and make it, you know, perfect. And she's 
walking in with a smile and jolly all these old different instruments like i want to do that <laughs> well i she, she said well you can't take these classes you're not an end major and i'm like i can't take these classes <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if you know this john but if you tell me i can't i say watch me <laughs> so next day i march over to my guidance counselor and i said i'm changing my major i want to be a music ed major she said, you're changing your major. Your scholarship is in performance. I go, okay, so double major. <laughs> I had my big scheme though, John, was that I was just going to take all those really fun classes and then drop them when I was done. <laughs> wow, you just really wanted the experience. I did. That's great. And you know, like she was hanging out with all these music ed majors and they were all playing with these different instruments and helping each other out. And I was stuck with myself in my music, in my practice room by myself for six hours a day. Like that's not community building. This is not no. collaboration, <laughs> this is no fun. And you know, as a guitar player, you're not in an orchestra and you're not in the band. If you're in the orchestra, you're the front person playing a concerto, right? Mm -hmm. So again, you're really the soloist on your own. So I did, I double majored it and um, I had a blast as an ed major. When they sent me out on field work, they sent you right out. They, they, want, they didn't want to keep anybody who was not meant to be a teacher in the music ed field. And they wanted to give you ample time to change that major if that major was not for you, which is not every college, um, but mine did that really well. And so, when I was in one of my first classes, they sent me out to do a 10 minute lesson in a neighboring elementary school. And I was terrified, petrified. I used my, my roommate as my guinea pig, my kindergarten, first grade guinea pig. And I packed up all my rhythm instruments and I went off to the school to do my 10 minute lesson. The teacher greets me at the door and she says, well, the kids are on their way to class. Um, but let me just tell you, there is one child who has a paraprofessional who is autistic and he's going to come in and he's going to need to go about his pattern in this classroom before he comes to the carpet. Just know that his para has him. You don't need to worry about it at all. Just go about your business. He'll join in when he's ready. <laughs> okay, great. So now we all come in, we're all seated on our carpet. I dish out all the instruments and the, the, le the kid comes over and he sits right here to my left. Little blonde, adorable little kid. His paraprofessional sits right behind him, ready to help him if he needs it. The kid never needed it. Mm -hmm. um, and the kid was on me, just like every other kid. You'd never know looking at these, this little circle that anything was different about any of these children. And we all had a blast. I packed it up. I thanked the kids for, for joining me. And I went on my merry way. Well, this paraprofessional came running after me. And she said, right before I got to the, the, the door to the parking lot, um, you know, he's never paid attention to any lesson the way he paid attention for your lesson. He's never engaged that way in any lesson, the way he engaged for you, you're in the right place. Keep doing it. Now, remember, I'm walking out of there going, I'm not going to be a music major. I'm taking all the fun classes and then I'm dropping it. Right. But at that moment, now I'm, I re I'm reflecting and I'm reflecting. I even, you know, like, what is it? 30 years since that happened, I still remember it like it was yesterday. Hmm. Well, yeah, what a crucial moment crucial moment. So obviously I didn't, I couldn't drop the music ed major. I was having mm -hmm. fun anyway. So I double majored. I graduated with two majors and a minor. Wow. And a minor. So what's the minor? Uh, percussion performance. Oh, okay. Cool. Which came in handy later on, right? Well, in your career. Yeah. Sure. Wow. So we have some comments. I just want to let, you know, acknowledge our uh, audience. Thank you so much for watching guys who are out there, guys and gals listening live and for those who catch on the replay, thank you for being here. Um, Angelina Diaquino said, or Diaquino, sorry if I'm not pronouncing it right. Yes, you can't, are. can't, don't say that in front of me. Uh, 
I think she's kind of laughing about that, that she spells it C-A-N-T spelled out, LOL. It's a, like, so, C-A-N apostrophe T, don't say that in front of me. Well, there it is. That Actually, she spelled it that way. I, I didn't catch it. Um, yeah. And then Ted, uh, Ted said, Ted Engelson says, uh, Brooklyn College wouldn't allow students to major in music unless you were proficient at the piano. Yeah, that changed uh, changed later because I got into uh, being a music major. Uh, actually, I failed the um, guitar uh, audition at Brooklyn College. I don't know if I if you knew that um, as a music major, <clears throat> um, they they had pretty high standards. I guess I I thought I was good enough, but I'm glad I did because then I became a music composition major, mm -hmm. which has allowed me to express my composing. And then I got in with my composition skills. I was able to show them, look, I can write it out in notation. And the guy, I remember Noah Krzyzewski was the teacher at the time. I think he's since passed away. And he said, okay, you're in. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Ted Engelson says, I still have my plastic recorder in the green cloth case from one of the only music classes they would allow me to take. Oh man. <laughs> Yeah, recorder. What a tough instrument to uh, to teach on the ears, right? Yeah. That high sound. Yeah. Although when you get them right, they can sound amazing. You got it. It's it's honing that that airstream. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, recorder. I I had some fun with that with the recorder. Uh, <clears throat> so, all right. So now you're a music education major, and. Did you see like music uh, performance kind of phasing out naturally or uh, or, no. or how did that work? No, In terms of like solo guitar stuff, I mean. Yeah, well, that was pretty traumatic actually, the way that kind of all happened. So I graduated in five, uh, well, four and a half years, two majors and a minor, um, but I didn't walk in graduation until the following May. So I got out in January. And as I got out, actually was hired before I got out uh, to teach music in, um, in five private schools. So it was like music on the move. And that was fun, you know, that was okay to get my, you know, my experience and, and it was trial by fire, <laughs> but I survived pretty well. And um, so I was working a lot of jobs at this one point in my life because music on the move wasn't paying enough. They mm -hmm. weren't, right? Um, so I was also I would leave that job and then I'd go to um, help out a photographer in Queens. I was driving from one job to the next in my car that I bought myself when I graduated. So I, I grad, remember I graduated in January, but I'm walking in May. So from May, January to May, I'm driving my brand new car that I bought myself and I'm trying to pay for it. So I'm working a couple of jobs and on my way from one job to the next, somebody comes out of, blows a stop sign, smashes into my car. Oh man. But she blew a stop sign into the whole side of my car and my whole car goes into oncoming traffic the whole side of the car is demolished luckily the car on the other side didn't hit me they saw me enough time and they they stopped so i didn't get hit from both sides but that was pretty catastrophic in that i have nerve damage in my my right hand side hmm. so anytime i picked up my guitar I could, had didn't not I could not make it through 20 minutes, let alone six hour practice sessions. Right. I had my debut performance was already booked, so I had to make it through my debut performance, which I had standing room only it happened to be my debut performance and my retirement all wrapped up into one. Right, I read that, man. Huh. But wow. see, well, back to the comment you made earlier. You said something about the universe had a plan for me. Mm -hmm. I believe very strongly that the universe knew all of this back when I was, I never want to be a music ed major to giving me a music ed major as a roommate. Right, <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. I think that the universe knew you're not going to be a cop. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to be a performer. 
it's these little craziness that we have to we have to show you the path we have to give you the path and and so i was set on the path thank you universe <laughs> to be a music ed major i i still can play i had a guitar made so that maybe i could get back to it and so it's custom made for me and taking into account the nerve damage that's in my right hand side but I even even with that, it took three years for that to be built. So in in that, you know, you kind of lose it. Mm. You know, the mo the momentum. And I just never oh, yeah. get back. And it's I can't sit for long enough to to get it back. Yeah, I totally I totally hear you. Um yeah, there I uh yeah, I definitely think that the accident in retrospect, because I know you have uh, you know, you could see with uh totally different view than when you were in it. Um, it seemed like maybe designed for your personality to make it sure that you couldn't do anything other than, you know, teach in a way. Um, yeah, no, but knowing you, who you are through the years, I could definitely see that, uh, I, you know, you wouldn't wish an accident on anyone, but I, I certainly, wouldn't have wanted to see someone like you not find your path, which you did, and the accident helped. For me, and I, when I was um, 33, I was diagnosed with diabetes, and uh, then it, it was an arduous journey, and that led me to being plant-based eater and uh, be more health conscious. Now I got a knee issue, um, so there's various things along my path that just kind of made me say you know, I had to just change some things up, you know, pretty significantly. Uh, and other th I mean, it's different, it wasn't an accident, but, but the diabetes thing hit me hard, you know, it kind of re rerouted me and uh, in some ways. And, uh, but um, for me, I, I love it. I, I, I say it's totally the, the disease designed for me. I really wouldn't want to not have it unless I just sort of naturally, so, or whatever technology can uh, overcome, you know, I got a pump and stuff but um yeah it's just it was like no, nothing could slow me down and make me take care of myself as effectively as this right. you know a lot of every otherwise it would be too cerebral or too uh um uh egoic in a way like jog now i jog just because it makes me feel better you know not to like outpace you know not to be impress anyone with my numbers or all right and i eat healthiest as I can because uh, it, I'm already at a detriment with my health. So eating as healthy as possible is so I could have more energy, you know, so it, it all kind of paid off. I want to get to a few um, comments here. Uh, so Ted says, Melissa's students loved her so much in, Man in Madison. She always had a loyal following of cool students. Yeah, I think anyone who knows you from Madison would would agree. Um, and Angelina Diaquino says, former student here, Miss Morris was my music teacher and advisory teacher. And if it wasn't for her, I, would, I wouldn't have been an English education major myself. It's more about the relationships you make with students. She's a trumpet player. <laughs> ah, okay, right, there you go. <laughs> Therefore, the love of trumpet. <clears throat> cool. Uh, all right, so now-, now we'll... I think Ted, I think, he had a bunch of followers too, mistaken, <laughs> right, Ted? <laughs> yeah, I've I've later met Ted in um, in uh, the in in the bar scene playing uh, original music. His original Thursdays group at a place called Greenhouse Cafe in Bay Ridge, and we would run into each other there playing music. So, um, yeah, he's a he's a cool guy. Cool. <clears throat> and uh, and Angelina says. You taught, Melissa taught me so much about teaching. So, yeah, I think I'm, I think I've heard. Uh, yeah, Mike Amari was saying similar things about the way you taught was really inspirational and influential to him as a teacher. It's always super nice to hear. Yeah. Because you yeah. know, like it, you build it, your relationships with kids, especially the. Being a community person, being a collaborator, my my collaborative partners are kids, mm -hmm. right? So if you got to build relationships with the people that you're going to be collaborating with, whoever that is, 
But as a teacher, especially as a music teacher, your collaborative partners are kids and they outnumber you. <laughs> so there's mm -hmm. only one of you and there's 30, 40, 50, 100 of them, right? In one room at one time. Um, and so we really, I really value every, every single one of those hearts, minds, spirits that are in, in my room, because really you guys shape who we become, the kind of teachers that we become. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember I only had one year uh, teaching music in, in a school. It was in a high school and that taught me that it's, I'm not cut out for that. It's not for me, but uh, the relationships I made with, I don't know, I, I would say four or five of them. And this was 2000, seven 2008 uh you know we're still in contact we was in east new york and somehow we made this cool bond mm -hmm. and uh i'm just honored that i was able to i'm so glad i have something to show for it because the you know otherwise there's there's nothing there's nothing to show for that year really besides saying that i did it but having those relationships means so much mm -hmm. to me uh so um I like how you said in one of your interviews that musicians thrive on improvisation. So can you explain a bit about how your natural inclination as a person, as a musician empowered you to not only cope with, but thrive throughout the, the pandemic situation or the emergency, whatever the words you said, you regarded less of a, right? Less of a pandemic, more of an emergency or a crisis. Crisis, crisis mm -hmm. situation. Yeah, um, as a classical player, you know, like, so when I say improvise, for, if you're talking to a jazz person, their use of the word improvise is going to be a lot different from mine. I'm a classical player, and in classical world, we play what other people write. Right. But um, one of the people who I really am inspired by all the time, and who, when I need to feel grounded, I kind of go back to is Victor Wooten. Mm -hmm. so, you know who he is, right? The bass player, right? The bass player. Um, and so like, if you watch his TED Talks, or you just watch him give a, a commencement speech or you watch anything by him and you hear him talk about musicianship or if you hear him talk about improvisation, it's like, it's like you could, when you're improvising and a note just doesn't feel right in the key, it's just move your finger one fret away. And it all of a sudden it's right there, right? Right, yeah. So if you apply that to, you know, life or to teaching and you think about, you know, like, okay, so if this didn't work, don't worry, it's just one fret away or it's one step away. You realize what didn't work. So now we move this way or we didn't work, we move this way, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. So it's like, I guess when I'm improvising or I use the word improvise, I'm talking about, you know, the path to something, the path to something that's going to work. It's, if it doesn't work, you just move it. You just tweak it a little bit. I try to tell that to the kids too, you know, like never be afraid to fail. Failure is just one step to, to greatness. Like it's mm -hmm. just, you're on your way. Like you're going to have to fail. And you know what? Each and every time you fail, the only time you should be, you should be um, embarrassed by it is sometime when you learn from it. Because if you can take each failure and learn from it, you're on your way to something great. Yeah. Nothing that was invented in life just was invented. <laughs> you had to go through all of these different failures, even your cars, right? Every five years, they change the model in our car and they tweak it. I just had to bring my car in for a recall because it needed a, a computer, I don't know, a computer update to work out the bugs. We're always working out bugs. Life is about working out the bugs, right? Mm -hmm. It's improvisational. What I'm talking to you about right now is just it's improvisational. The way you're talking to me is improvisational. Yeah, just, yeah. Just, yeah, in the flow of life, right? Yeah, you're in the flow. And so that's how I think about improvisation. And so then when the, uh, the pandemic hit or, you know, the whole, now we got socially distance and, and the way of teaching was flipped on its head. Uh, 
I imagine that outlook, you know, gave you at least uh, some optimism walking in towards what might have been, you know, pretty uh, uncomfortable, I guess, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was super uncomfortable. You know, we sat, um, the music teachers, you know, you, you come from, from a music department of when you were there it was three teachers, right? Grew to four maybe while you were still there, but we're now nine teachers. So okay. when cl we closed, you know, we really literally closed overnight in March of 2020. We mm -hmm. literally closed, we got three days to figure out how we were going to, you know, start school online, right? Oh, and so the music teachers were just sitting in their um, socially distanced room with our masks and our laptops, figuring how are we going to do this? What are our options? No kid had instruments. We're all instrumental music, except if you're in chorus, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't get a chance to send home any instruments. So how are we doing this? And so we planned for what we thought would be a really good start solid start until you open on day one and none of those things work or one of those things out of the 10 or the, the 30 that you had in your mind so you have to say well okay so this didn't work tweak it tweak it tweak it and as you're tweaking you're asking the kids for feedback you gotta ask the kids like how is this working for you how is this because you're only the one perspective they're the the other 50 percent if unless you get those two fifty those 50 percent aligned <laughs> you're never gonna get it right no so asking the kids uh, i felt was like the most important thing to do and then the kids have to be able to provide you with feedback, which is really hard for a kid. Mm. Like they ha have to be able to give you like, this is working for me, this is not working for me. And oftentimes they don't know. So you got to ask them a number of times so that they reflect on it each and every time and come back with better information. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do what we could. I think, I think all in all, I would call my crisis education a success, but not for every kid. Mm -hmm. So when you use the word thrive, I'm like, mm. I'm, I hope in, in people's perspective, I did thrive in my own. Granted, we're always harder on ourselves. I didn't get 100%. So I don't know about thrive, but I did the absolute best possible job I could with what I was given and what the kids gave back to me as feedback I tried each and every day harder and harder each and every day well I think that that is the thriving part that you for some reason didn't get jaded didn't give up because I see your spirit and your attitude about it which to me means you're thriving even if you know 70 out of a out of 100 things are going wrong every day you know it the spirit to just like rise to the occasion and and be optimistic you know th that that's why i would use the word thriving of course i'm not behind the scenes i can only imagine the the challenges that wouldn't put be non-stop throughout that whole period but uh yeah because i can also imagine just well i, I also i i had experience uh teaching for a band four kids it was a rock band uh in the from march to july last year i was still i was teaching i was working at broken college and so i had that experience and even though the kids were wonderful there was and with only four there was this like it was just really taxing on my soul to teach through the screen and of course they want to play together they were a band you know and but you know who knows what any individual is going through at home so maybe they have the camera off or the sound off because they're embarrassed of something, right? And you can't like call them on it too many times because then it's just like the whole lesson is is that. And then kids defend each other. So, or at least they protect each other. So then, you know, no one wants to be the goody two shoes too much. And so I just felt like, I don't know, it was draining my soul. So I can only imagine if I had a lot of students and I had to do it every day, <laughs> you know? So yeah, and that you could keep maintain your positive energy through it, that to me is thriving.
because it would be challenging for anybody. Yeah. Sometimes it was really hard to maintain that positive. Sometimes it was really hard. Yeah, but that, you're only human. So uh, Robert Ram says you were awesome. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, so you, Rob, and uh, Sunita uh, Nwachuku, friend of mine, says my grandson plays the guitar. That's great. Yeah, it's uh, keeping music in one's life, no matter to if it's a smaller or greater degree. I, I, I'm an advocate. Uh, I have a book in me. Maybe one day I'll get to it. I'm um, called uh, Guitar for Health, mm. which is just a concept that no matter when you pick it up, there's just benefits to, to playing an instrument. And in my case, I would recommend guitar, but of course, any instrument, uh, you know, just that process of learning what three notes are called, you know, or knowing when you do if you call them by number, the fret number zero, two, four, that it makes this sound that has a logic to it. You know, it's just, it's good for the brain. It is. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, okay, let's, I, I think we might have to do a part two. I, I don't know if we're gonna get, we're just like touching, scratching the questions, but uh, anyway, um, let's see. Can you tell us about one or two of your standout memories of your favorite live music experiences? Um, I imagine it'll be, you know, with involving you and your students, but of course it could be some concert you went to if that's what jumps out of you. Well, that's, that's a good point. Um, when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking about, you know, my own inspirational things that inspired me to be more musical or to know that music was my path but my favorite musicians are always my students mm -hmm. and so um one of the most standout moments um was when we brought uh the trans-siberian orchestra mark wood mm -hmm. and the electric violinist yep um into madison and we i i was teaching orchestra at the time and um, I don't know if you remember this. You were in, in the school. I, I remember when Mark Wood came. I might have was at 99 or something or 2000. I remember I was aware of it, but I wasn't in, in school. So. In the school, yeah. No, it was 2008. And oh. it was two, because I was pregnant. So it was 2006, then 2008. So we had him twice. Okay. Um, yeah, I remember hearing about it from you. Yeah. So Ray, my, one of my violinists, uh, Ray's Asian. Ray's always, always very reserved, quiet, can play, nice kid, um, collaborative, but always, always lead, led through his quiet demeanor. Because he was my, my, um, my principal violin too. Principal violin one, principal violin two. He was the leader of that section. But he would always go home and <laughs> and he would come in and he was playing i can't remember the lick i wish he was i wish he was listening right now because he would tell me the lick but he was practicing this one lick and it was all triplets it was a whole triplet run and mark came to work on it with us during rehearsal and i said play that for him he played that for him and he's like that's awesome dude helped him tweak it during rehearsal. Then that night, the kids had to come back and look like rock stars. Well, Ray, you never saw Ray <laughs> look anything other than, you know, perfectly put together. Um, but he came in and, and he said to Ray, I want you to go home and I want you to practice this in a mirror. Before you come back, I want you to know it by heart, in your head, without looking, practice in the mirror with your hair spiked up or something like this. Uh -huh. And look like a rock star. So, Ray would, you know, normally be sitting down. Ray actually stood up, had to stand up and play with Mark Wood <laughs> side by side. And the kid had his hips moving and he was, and I literally in the audience, pregnant, like you wouldn't believe it, oh, man. start crying, <laughs> real sobbing. Uh -huh. Because I saw Ray in a way I've never, ever seen him before. Mm -hmm. And it took that, it was literally in hours, this transformation. 
of this right. very stoic, very, um, I don't want to say controlled, but, and rigid is even not, he wasn't rigid, but he was very proper, you know? Mm -hmm. okay. And then this knight comes and he's a totally different, he's a rock and roll star. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember, I will never ever forget it. I've actually seen it on video a couple of times since that time. Now we're going back to 2006. Um, but, oh my gosh, that <laughs> amazing night. Another amazing night, which in, it involves tears, but it was with my son. Uh, my sister saw him for uh, in one of his birthdays, I think 10 or 11, something, right? some 10 or 11. Um, he loved the Imagine Dragons. So mm -hmm. she said, the Imagine Dragons are coming to PNC Bank Art Center. Can I get Charlie tickets for his birthday? I said, absolutely. So she got her son and she got my son and she got herself and I bought myself a ticket, right? So we now have four tickets to go see Imagine Dragons. He'd never been to a concert before, ever. We're at <laughs> PNC Bank Art Center and you know, the opening act comes out and he's very unimpressed. He wants to get ice cream, wants to get a waffle, whatever, right? Um, now imagine Dragons comes out and they play his favorite song. They start oh, yeah. playing his favorite song. He turns to me, he's in tears. Now <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my gosh, are you okay? Like, is it too loud? <laughs> he goes, this is so cool. <laughs> And I started crying. I, right now, I'm even wanting to cry. Because <laughs> for a kid to be moved by music is to that extent, to where it brings you to tears, right? is just extraordinary. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm sure he will be embarrassed by that story <laughs> when he hears it. But maybe as an adult, when he gets older, he'll be glad that you uh, so vividly <laughs> recalled that. Um, but yeah, there's nothing to be ashamed of crying at a car. I've, I've cried at concerts uh, of heavy metal shows just because it was like my favorite band. And, uh, you know, I was just so happy to commune so close to them, you know? Yeah. So I, I totally get it. Yeah. Awesome. Love those good ones. Uh, so can you talk about the Global Teacher Prize recognition in 2015 uh, and the 2020 Sanford Teacher Award? Um, I don't know the details of those and how, how did that, those awards and the organizations involved with that contribute to how you are in the classroom and, 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 and your students as well? The Global Teacher Prize 2015, so I was not at Madison. Mm -hmm. I had my baby 2006. I took some time off. And when I returned to teaching in 2000. I don't even remember what year I returned, but when I returned, I re had to, re there was already somebody in my position at Madison. Now I could have kicked them out of my position and taking it back, but that was probably not in the best interests of Madison's, pro um, what they had been going on and where they were at. And it was not in the best interests of me from a mom standpoint. So James Madison High School helped me get um, an interview with probably one of the most inspirational principles ever, at least in my life. I've had really good principles. I've had three really inspirational principles. I know this is not answering your question, but she's one of them. Um, and then I had a bunch of cruddy ones. <laughs> but um, anyway, so she hires me to build a program completely different, a music program completely different from any other in the city and gives me complete vision, a license. It says, here's the money, go do it. So wow. it was an international study school. So in international studies, like, so you wanna build something that's going to align with their vision and mission, right? So I built uh, a world percussion ensemble right okay instruments from all over the world and in that we were training and this is where angelina comes in um we were training kids to be leaders and drum circle facilitators so they were not just learning about musicianship but they were learning about leadership 
in community, collaboration, mm -hmm. all of these very important skills that we all need today, 21st century learning skills. Sure. Collaboration, uh, communication, critical thinking, problem solving, all of this stuff, all through the lens of music. And um, we also were not, we were looking to collaborate, but not just within our school. Our school was tiny, only 500 students, right? So mm -hmm. you came out of a school with 4,000 students. This was only 500. And so we outreached to the different boroughs. We brought them in. We facilitated drum circles for students outside our school and, and also included them included people in different countries. So when all was said and done in 2015, and I shouldn't say said and done because it continued to grow, but we got recognition because we had built our community from our 500 person school to being th over 3,500 people around the world were part of our circle of influence, meaning that they joined our musical, um, our musical force, mm -hmm. I'm force. And the Global Teacher Prize was a brand new prize that year, a $1 million prize for the best teacher in the world. Mm -hmm. So out of 122, I'm pulling numbers off the top of my head, so don't quote, but something like 122 countries and tens of thousands of applicants, they narrowed it down to 50. And then from the 50, they went to the 10. And then from the 10, they picked the one. The one would win the million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to the top 50 in 2015, which was enormous. Like l lost my, you know what, when I got <laughs> the announcement. Yeah. And then fast forward. Um, so that, that grew me a network a network of people that grows by 50 every year since 2015. So uh, all of those teachers really help shape who I become and the next steps and the next steps in the vision of what I see for tomorrow or me in my classroom for the students of tomorrow, of today and tomorrow, right? So it's, a, it's, it's evolutionary because I have a, an incredible network of the world's top teachers. And so um, in 2019, I was nominated for the Sanford Teacher Award, which is not global, it's national. But I was, I won, I won top teacher for New York in that year. Actually, I found out I won it the day after my dad passed away. Oh, man. So that was a pretty surreal moment. It was almost like pretend. But, yeah. uh, you know, that's another very large national network where I, I get to learn from so many extraordinary teachers. Hmm. You know, it's just, I started out wanting to be a cop when I was, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old because I wanted to build community. I wanted to be part of community greatness. Mm -hmm. but the police academy was not part of that, but I definitely am in some amazing communities doing amazingly amazing things around the world and around the country. Yeah, I'm checking out the sites that you shared with me, uh, the links which will be in the show notes. So anyone who's watching who wants to check out more of what Melissa Morris is up to and talking about, there'll be this, uh, links there. Um, but uh, afterwards, after the show. But um, yeah, I mean, I always... I guess from early on, I sensed you were about community probably more than anything else. And I would say fun too, community and fun. And uh, yeah, but then seeing your development and getting into the drumming and, you know, actually for me, I was a little surprised that you went into uh, strings, you know, in the beginning there, but, but you know, just always curious, you know, that's what I noticed about you. You were curious, you're willing to take, for you, the departure from guitar to strings or orchestra seemed not a big deal, uh, to me, it would have been a big deal because I was really guitar oriented if I was in your shoes, right? But I guess because you were just so filled with curiosity and the community aspect was bigger than the attachment to the guitar or, or 
particulars of the music. Um, Angelina the Aquino says again, woo, I was the only trumpet player in the world percussion ensemble. Thank you for giving me that. And she said, so proud with several exclamation points. Thank you for doing that, Angelina. That was a, a leap of faith, but you did a great job. Yeah, I remember getting uh, the CD that you made with musicians from that school. Um, was that connected or uh, was that a little bit different? No, that was, that was them. Mm -hmm. Was it just our way of trying to get our music out there? And the more you can get your music out there, the more you get people who want to join in in on the fun. I also, uh, on a side, I wanted the kids to be really proud of the accomplishments that they made because not only were they incredible leaders and, and community builders in helping to impart the skills on others, every, every once a month, I would be bringing in another school and saying, now share what you know with them, <laughs> share what you know with them, share what you know with them. Right. Um, but they were incredible musicians aside from their leadership training and aside from their problems. All of those, all of those skills that we were doing through the lens of music created intense musicians. Mm -hmm. Right. Where you and I started, we were music, music majors. Right. So we wanted to, you were a composition major. You were learning how to compose. I was a music major learning how to play. We sat, I sat in my, my practice room by myself learning music. And when I got that job, I turned that on its head. No, we're not going to learn music. We're going to learn leadership, critical thinking, problem solving, community building. And let's see what that does for us as musicians. And mm -hmm you can give me an opinion you and you're allowed to tell me you don't like it you listen to the music were they incredible musicians yeah it's it was it was international music you know that's what i heard there was global it was the sound of global citizens right playing music and yeah. that, you know above and beyond what yeah what you have the opinion of whether it's going to be your favorite cd forever this is a this is a moment in time this is a uh very impressive work. Uh, I would say even humanitarian work in a sense, right? Raising global leaders. So were, were they tight as musicians? I, I haven't listened to the CD in a long time, but it was very enjoyable. It was very enjoyable to listen. Yeah, it was not not hard to listen to. It sounded like music. Yeah, too bad we don't have one queued up. We could play it. Right. Yeah. Actually, you know, I, I recently. Well, yeah, that probably would it would work. Um, I played uh, some of my music. I did a thing recently I played stream not performed I put on recording and on the playback it's all silent for any of the parts where my music comes up because my music is copywritten or sorry is uh it's um it's overseen by my distributor and and somehow it just Facebook sees that as infringement even though it's my music it stinks <laughs> so silly so I can't live stream my music no. uh, it, it won't work but if, if the CD hasn't been, you know, pro distributed or whatever, then they probably wouldn't stop it. Not yeah, sure. but yeah, you're right. If it was queued up, we could put it on. Yeah. Uh, so what about um, Music Teachers for Global Peace? Uh, is that connected to this or is it a different organization? That came about with... Um... Actually, that was kind of like born out of a lunch conversation um, with Michael DeVellis. Mm -hmm. um, he's one of the teachers at James Madison High School. We were sitting having lunch, talking about you know collaboration and, and the importance of of kids knowing and how music helps kids to be global citizens and to know and appreciate different cultures. And we know and appreciate different cultures from the sound that we hear. And like, that's really cool, right? I wanna play that music. I love the way that sounds. Or the diversity of instruments, right? You wouldn't, you join a band or you play in a band because you get to play with different people and different instruments. You know, like a flute ensemble, all flutes. It's pretty, right? But at some point in time, you're like, I wish I could play with a saxophone player, a trumpet player, a guitar player, a harp, right? 
a harmonica. At some point in time, you're looking for all of those different sounds. And the different sounds feed us in a way that, you know, a one instrument ensemble kind of doesn't after a while, right? It feeds mm -hmm. us, but it's not, it's like having the same food all the time, like eating only <laughs> salad. At some okay. point you want a donut in there, right? <laughs> so um, anyway, so we were having this conversation about the impact that music has and we um, wanted to expand our collaborative Im impact or our collaborative opportunities maybe is the right word to um, be with other people you know across the globe who are also music teachers so music teacher for global peace tries to link um, music classrooms with other music classrooms in different parts of the world hmm. yeah i listened to uh one of the uh pieces recently from that uh from music teachers for global peace i, I don't know if mr develis wrote it or it was just conducting it but uh it was really solid, really beautiful. I just put in the background as I was researching for this uh, podcast and um, yeah, just good music. And and everyone had a very bright energy, you know, which is, yeah, that that's, it seems like a very respectful um, approach to, uh, you know, the dignity of each person and, and, and respecting music itself too, like the art form. It did sound good, you know? Yeah. That was played in four different countries. Right, and which is terrific. Edited by also another alumni. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember Jason Markowitz? Sounds familiar, but I don't know if I remember him. Was he after me, I imagine? I don't, I don't know if he was after you. You know, you guys all <laughs> blend in. Yeah. I, can, I can separate you, the Madison kids from the uh, CSI high school kids, but that's about all I can do. All the CSI kids are all the same age and all the Madison kids, even my new Madison kids now, because I returned mm -hmm. to Madison in 2016, you're all the same age to me, <laughs> <laughs> which they would probably be sad to know that they were, they're 40. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I graduated in 98, so uh, yeah, I was in the first, that first uh, cut for you. I guess there's one class before me that graduated that you saw, but. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I probably wasn't linked really closely with them. Yeah, at that point, right? Yeah. Um, Angelina said she just turned 22 last week. All right. <laughs> happy, happy belated birthday. Um, yes. Oh, so uh, what about the National Coalition for Safe Schools? I imagine that's a slightly heavy subject, but it sounds to me that uh, it's kind of a, a anti-violence or pro-safety type of thing. Yeah, for sure. So that came about um, right after Parkland. So Parkland happened, I'm driving home in my car in tears listening to it on the news. And um, I called up one of my Global Teacher Prize network people and I was having a conversation with him and he said, yeah, I, I'm in the same place as you. I'm gonna call up another one of our Global Teacher Prize network people and we'll circle back. We have to do something about this. So on the day of uh, Parkland, which was February 14th, um, on that day, we already had started our connection. The organization wasn't born um, really into the nonprofit world until much later, because it takes a while, but it was on that day that we linked together and we said, we are going to do something about it. And um, that year in Dubai, when they take us, the Global Teacher Prize people, they take you to Dubai once a year, we met some of the Parkland kids and we, we talked to them and we got to know them. We held a a meeting there and it was there that the national coalition seemed to really take flight um and then when we returned back to the states it continued its momentum and uh i don't remember what year 
we got our nonprofit status, but we're a nonprofit. And our vision is not from a, or our mission is not from the standpoint of gun control, although that is a huge piece of the puzzle that the country needs to address. We address it from uh, the social emotional standpoint because we figure if we can, we, if we can address the things that trouble, trouble students in our schools, when they start to become troubled or they start to have an emotion that's maybe going to be troublesome down the line, if we can fix it there, we can fix it for all of society. But if we can't, if we wait for them to graduate school and now they're in the world or if they're now too old and they've just been dealing with all of this turmoil all of these years, it's just, you know, it's like a snowball effect. It gets, it gets into an unmanageable place and then they erupt. Mm -hmm. So that's our, our mission from the National Coalition. So that's through one of those amazing networks. And, and, and the Global Teacher Prize Network is, is just what started it. It's not, it's not only in that network. It's, it seeks to be nationwide, network-wide, so many networks that want to intermingle. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. Uh, it doesn't surprise me at all that, that you're a part of it. Uh, what, I mean, you're a part of a lot, right? So that doesn't exactly surprise me, but I could imagine that it's, uh, I, I guess it probably both feeds you, you thrive on it, and also it's just your nature attracts that type of various networks and communities you know to me it seems like a lot to to manage but um it's, yeah they must be uh let's see so oh yeah i was excited to read the article where you uh where it talks about you um teaching kids to do a podcast uh i guess this was last year uh when the epidemic uh, pandemic started yeah, so how, how did that go? How did that come about? And I asked something about teaching them how to ask questions, I saw. Well, okay, so why are we musicians? We, music is a form of expression, right? But when you take away their ability to express themselves with their instrument, because they remember they couldn't take their instrument home, we had to find ways, at least for me in my head, I would need them to be able to express themselves period, end of discussion. <laughs> and if they can't do it with their instrument because they never got a chance to get it out of the building and get at home, we got to find a different way. And so we gave them um, access, or actually I should say Soundtrap. Soundtrap gave all kids across the country free access to their platform. Mm -hmm. And that was really, when I found that, that was like a game changer. Because mm -hmm. now that they, now they could use the loops, they could use the, the digital instruments that were available to them. Now, while my kids, my students don't know how to use a piano or don't know how to play the piano, I was able to get them to be able to use the piano to make music. It's a digital piano. I, on your keyboard, on your computer keyboard, or even on the screen, touch screen. Mm -hmm. um, they could use loops and things like that. But then, so when we were making, when we were expressing ourselves through music, through a digital lens, then I said, you know what, it's time for us to talk, right? And there was these social justice things that were going on. Like we are going to mm. Log like like you were talking about logging, making a log, making a journal, maybe a, a podcast, an interview, whatever it is that you want to do on on uh, soundtrack. So they learned how to talk with people. Some of them chose to interview people. Some of them chose to just make it about them themselves and just talk through. Some of them just um, the big question was, and they could change it was. How is music helping you get through the pandemic? Great question. <laughs> right? And so talk to your parents, talk to your little, your siblings, talk to your cousins, talk to your best friend. How is music helping you get through the pandemic? And if they decided they wanted to change that topic, they absolutely could. Many of them stuck with that one. One did a beautiful 
um, interview with her sister, her older sister. Like that was like jaw dropping how amazing that came out. Um, you know, things that she never even realized her sister was thinking about, you know, how is, how, how is the older sister gonna support the younger sister getting through the pandemic? when mm -hmm. dad lost his job and mom was never working in the first place because she was a, a stay-at-home mom. So there's no money now, right? Mm -hmm. Just, you know, and then when you get to listen to them back, you got a chance to understand where they were coming from. Some of them yeah. really opened up and that was transformative for me because then I knew what was my next step. Mm -hmm. Was it uh, the case that <clears throat> only you could hear the podcast back or were they able, able to listen to each other's shows they didn't want to share them with one another so yeah i get I, it i could see that i could see that i kept it close um you know honoring their their wishes it was a couple of times where i said hey would you want would you be okay with me sharing that and they were all like nope wow it, they won't even turn on their cameras <laughs> right. share their feelings <laughs> right right yeah yeah, it, it's amazing to me how uh, how different some people are about wanting to be public with their life, you know, but also different ages play into that, of course. But uh, but some people, you know, they, in their older age, they just don't want to. I had a good one good friend I asked to be on the show. He goes, nah, it's just I'm a quiet person. I don't really think I have anything to say. I'm like, I'm sure you have a lot to say, but if it's not for you, I get it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, some people are protective. I get it, yeah. but that's cool uh, because that that teaching uh, podcasting because clearly it's a thing that exists right now, and uh, you know who knows uh, whether it's something people do in a professional context or more than likely just as an expression or a way of creating community, you know, which is the spirit of this really. Uh, it's a good skill to know. And, and also I think it plays into the whole uh, anti-violence thing or, um, right? Because the more you express yourself, uh, the less you bottle up to, to explode, you know? 100%. So yeah, I'm, I'm all about expression, expression and uh, yeah, being authentic, allowing kids and any human beings to that space to be authentic. Uh, so can you tell us one of the greatest lessons you've learned along your journey that helps you remain positive, upbeat, and moving forward? A smile goes a long way. Yep. Yeah. Which is hard when you have a mask on. <laughs> <laughs> one of the biggest conversations I had, or one of the earliest conversations I had when the kids were able to come back and we're all masked up. I said, do you find that when you smile, you have to smile bigger so that you can make your eyes smile? Because if you can make your eyes smile, then people will realize that you have a smile under there. Right. The, some of the kids were like, you're right, you're right. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I also like the line in one of Pitbull's songs, he says, um, every day above ground is a great day. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. So when life is kind of like giving you, you know, a hard time or some people say giving you lemons, you got to make lemonade. Mm -hmm. I'll say, you know, like Pipple says, every <laughs> day above ground is a great day. And if Pipple says it, it must be true. Right. right. And they're like, oh, okay, you're right. Every day above ground is a great day. Yeah, that's a good quote for, for a high school audience, I imagine. Yeah. Right. They can get that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it, uh, I was just chanting before, uh, chanting my Buddhist prayers, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, before this. And um, one of the I, I always read, I study a little bit in the morning, I study at night, just something. It, studying Buddhism for me is more like brushing teeth or taking a shower. It's just to refresh myself, deepen it a little more. It's not like to, it's not entertainment, like a story or something like that. And uh, anyway, it just, the point was that um, we're all, it, was, it was a line saying about we're all going to die and it, more, a little more eloquent than that, but that, you know, life is limited. So uh, really just a reminder to make the most of each day, each precious moment, each interaction, you know, don't waste your youth, you know, really 
don't be afraid to struggle. Don't be afraid to, uh, to uh, sort of invite hardship, really. That's what, what it was saying. Not, not like, uh, not to be uh, masochistic or anything, but to just welcome challenges that you know might be pretty difficult, but you could see the potential for growth there, you know? Because when you get older, if you do that, you uh, don't regret having challenged yourself. But I can imagine if you don't challenge yourself, you might regret that. Yeah. You know. Uh, um, okay. Has your taste in music shifted and evolved over the years? I imagine it has. Well, I I think I think no. I always you know when you ask a music teacher what their favorite kind of music is. Yeah, you know, music, all music is my favorite kind of music. There is music that I don't allow in my space because it's n too negative for me. Mm -hmm. So I won't allow something which has got ex a huge amount of curses. I don't allow that kind of in my space that that does not do good things for my emotional. My for sure. emotional <laughs> totally, totally get it. So when you talk about music, I don't, I still love country music. I still love classical music. I'm not a huge opera fan, although I have a, a huge, huge amount of respect for opera and those who can write it. Um, it's not, I won't buy tickets to an opera. It's not my, my thing. <laughs> but when I started teaching at CSI High School for International Studies, I started to explore my love of different music of different cultures and while i always had a, a strong appreciation for it i started to find myself wanting to hear it more like even on my playlist when i pop my apple play in the car and i hit my music and it shuffles and it comes like to my my um my global sounds i'm like oh yes <laughs> it's like oh good don't turn that one off try <laughs> um yeah so i i think just that that particular environment that i was teaching in ex expanded my appreciation for global sounds mm. i really loved it there's a there's a, a song that recently came out i think by angelique kijo does that sound familiar you ever hear of her african uh, it's angelique kijo featuring um sting Oh. It's called Mother Nature. You might want to check it out. It's it's a world yeah. music thing, and it's great video. It, you know, it's it speaks to climate change and how dignity of life thing. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's really powerful. Angelina, Angelina, say it again. Uh, Angelique, uh, Q U E at the end, and Kijo, K I D J O maybe. All right, I'll search. Yeah, Mother Nature with sting that's cool very inspiring uh so do you have a this kind of my if you feel like you've answered this already but um okay you could skip it but do you have a spiritual philosophy that guides and informs what you do and how do you how you live each day moment by moment i believe in the universe the universe has shown me that the universe does exist <laughs> not i'm not religious so much as i am like I believe in the universe. Mm -hmm. There's a path. I just have to trust it. Mm -hmm. So trusting in something greater, like in, in a bigger picture. I don't know what that something is. I call it the universe. Yeah, I totally get it. Yeah, I, 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 I tend to call to say the universe when I'm referring to that something greater rather than a God or some other term. Um, it just seems to be more succinct you know uni one universe like the one great big all that is you know uh yeah because something in you seems to uh somehow you seem fueled to have this hunger to contribute i don't know hunger might be the wrong word uh drive to contribute and and like be optimistic, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure there's many days where you're not as optimistic that I don't see, you know, as I might see on Facebook or whatever, but, um, 
but it's, you know, talking to you now, I feel it. So I, it's interesting to me, uh, do you read spiritual books or is this is just more like living your life and hearing music? It just kind of enriches you. Well, I actually just recently read Think Like a Monk by Jason, oh, yeah. which I oh. thought was really important because my brain, I, I think you know this about me, maybe just never articulated it to you, but my brain doesn't stop. Like it's always on like moving 150 miles an hour. Like it's ever, it's always, I have all those organizations, right? I, they are, it's always going. There's always mm -hmm. sparks flying. So to manage that is tricky. So meditation, people are like, you should meditate. And I'm like, I should meditate. And I want to meditate, but slow this thing down. It's really very difficult. But in, in that particular book, he made me feel like it's okay to have these sparks going. You want those sparks going. You're just going to have to learn to calm them. And that's the, the whole idea of meditating is to calm them so that you can decipher all of it. And then you can be your most impactful life or live your most impactful life when you can start to make sense of all these sparks that are flying all at one time. So I thought that that was really very helpful, um, that particular book. But Victor Wooten, go back to Victor Wooten. He wrote a book, have you read it called The Music Lesson? Oh yeah, no. Oh, you gotta read it. <laughs> very spiritual guy as well. And he's very into um, nature and, and nature as, a, um, as it feeds music and music as it intertwines with nature. Um, he even has a, a camp down in, in Nashville that you can go to. And oh, cool. like he'll teach you not only music and you don't have to be a bass player to go to a Victor Wooten camp, but he'll take you out into nature and you know talk you through all of that and music as a language and things like that so um those are the type of books that i i like to read i like to read things that you know make help me make sense of my own self within the world you know mm -hmm. i also think that universe shows you that the universe is there when you take the wrong path <laughs> it's hard all of a sudden right you know, I experience that all the time. Like, <laughs> it's too hard. Like, oh, I should, I shouldn't have gone through that door. The door was probably <laughs> closed for a reason. Mm -hmm. right? Back out, figure out how to get out of that maze and get back on the right road. Yeah. So the universe is pretty strong guide for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it does it, but it does it. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that I, I could totally relate to that. And um, yeah, I, I tend to think <clears throat> that there are no, um, I mean, you can't to say that no, no errors might not be what I want to say, but, um, you know, like, like you were saying, you know, if you got to fail uh, as many times as you need to in order to, to succeed and then when you succeed, what is that really anyway? Because then there's something else that you want to challenge probably, you know, most of us, um, because resting on our laurels doesn't, doesn't do a whole lot for us either. But yeah, it's that willingness to, to get up, you know, get knocked down nine times, you get up 10 and then that's victory really, you know? Uh, yeah, I'll just, well, before it escapes me, I, I did want to share just in case you didn't know about it. What I do is uh, I chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. This is a Tina Turner chance to a lot of people have learned about it through her. Um, but uh, for me, because meditating was very challenging for me. And, uh, you know, I, the busy thoughts, you know, I'm a coffee drinker. I, I am drinking coffee now. So it's, you know, I've always had so much going on. I'm kind of classic. Maybe I'm not classic, but I'm, I'm an overachiever. I've discovered that about myself. I think you might fall into that category a bit yourself and, you know, taking on a lot, it, because I can or whatever, because I think, you know, if, like you said, you have the, uh, if someone tells me I can't, I'm going to do a thing. I, I don't know if I have that, but uh, I do had the, I've had this drive to like go above and beyond throughout my life, you know, and part and part might be because my father died when I was six and I felt like I was kind of the, the protector of the house, if not the man of the house. And I had to just be more mature, whatever my reasonings are. Um, but so I have the busy mind and chant, uh, sorry, um, 
meditation is lovely. I, along my journey, I tried it and I did, I, once in a while I go back to it, but nothing ever worked for me quite. And I pray when I was a practicing Catholic, I would pray and, and I thought that was good. It was useful, but it wasn't until I started chanting, chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, especially because I'm a musician, perhaps, and the busy mind. Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. It's like in 6 8. And so it has this rhythm. I, it's the rhythm of the universe as we, that's how we learn it. And it's, it can be chanted quickly. It can be chanted slowly. It can be chanted loud, like, like a roaring lion, you know? So it's not like this always quiet thing. And uh, we often chant in groups, you know, now the pandemic changed that for a bit, but that's normally there's opportunities, but we chant every day by ourselves as practitioners. But I just mentioned it because when I um, want to quiet my mind, the, the meditating is beautiful, except that it's just not practical for me. Yeah. I don't like to do it, you know? <laughs> so um, I, like, I'm not drawn to it, but to chant, I'm drawn to. And, uh, and I chant and you can, it's a concentration and a meditation at the same time. And my mind goes, but still like if it's right here, whatever's on my mind, the merry-go-round of things that I'm dealing with, it becomes here when I'm chanting. So at least I have that perspective and I see the bigger picture. And then I realize, okay, where, where can I bring up courage? Where can I bring compassion to today to at least take one step forward that will be a, a useful step or a half step, yeah. but at least not to step back or to, to remain idle. And uh, yeah, it was... Uh, that was game changer for me. I've been practicing for since 2009, you know, every day chanting and I, and try as I made to do other practices before that, nothing stuck until I found that. Uh, yeah. So I thought I'd share and uh, Herbie Hancock actually uh, practices and he, he wrote, he wrote a book about it, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah. What, do you know what the book is called? Um, well, I know he wrote the intro to Buddha, Buddha in your mirror that would be a good place to start if, if you were curious. And then you could find out if he, he did a long Ted talk about Buddhism and jazz. Um, I think, or some talk, you know, to a big crowd. Oh, I got to check it out. Yeah. Uh, if you're cool, I have two, three more questions for you. Are you still good? We're here. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Um, so I, you, you've shared a few setbacks, but, uh, the question is, are there any setbacks you'd feel comfortable to share and which music has helped you to pull through? Well, I think that one just kind of goes, pulls right, right at the time my dad died. The music kind of rescued me. Mm -hmm. And again, was it, it sounded like you playing music was what, what rescued you, you and your guitar, holding your guitar and kind of. Just kind of knowing that. I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to call it a safety net. More like a friend, you know. Because mm -hmm. people, you know, the people go about their their day. They go about their lives. They'll give you a phone call. They'll give you a kind word or a kind text. But they go about their day. But the guitar's day or the guitar's the music's only purpose is there for me, right? Mm -hmm. And music is there for you. And music is there for each of us, right? So when i needed something and i knew i could i could rely on it that instrument was there and i just play my heart out mm -hmm. the other yeah. thing that's always there is the dog <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly when i when he knew the guitar was coming out he'd hear the click click of the the case mm -hmm. <laughs> right down at my feet <laughs> oh wow so you want to be near it you like the vibrations right there Oh, that's great. Yeah, when you were describing the guitar, I, I did get an image of a, a dog, you know, like a dog is that tried and true friend, right? But for whatever reason, dogs and humans are friends. Uh, yeah, and I actually, when you were talking about the guitar before and, and how important it is to you, uh, I kind of associate the guitar. Yeah, friend is a very good way to describe it. It could be lover, right? You know, you could have a, that strong relationship depending on how, how, uh, how you are with the guitar. Um, and uh, uh, also I, I would, I, I refer to some of my guitars as like a horse, my horse, 
you know, or, or, or my ax or sword, my sword. Like if, if you, you know, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan or something or some sort of knight chivalry thing, just how important someone's sword is. If, if they're a knight or if they're a, a warrior that their own very specific sword, you know, not just any sword. So like I had this one guitar electric that I played in several bands for years, jazz and rock metal. And then I had to sell, I chose to sell it when I went to Japan. And then I, uh, when I came back, a friend of mine traded it back to me because I had sold it to a friend. Uh, I, I didn't have money to buy it back. He offered, I'm like, he's like, John, this, when I took it to get fixed, the guy who fixed it said, this is John Henry's guitar, man. And uh, I was like, all right, I understand if having it doesn't feel right. And I traded, I traded him one that I had and I got it back and I started playing it. It had been years. So I'm like, wow, I feel like I'm back on my steed. You know, like if, it, if I was a horse rider, <laughs> this would, it just felt so good. Yeah. It did things that I only, maybe only I knew it could do or it responded to me. And I don't actually, I don't have it anymore again, it, but it's with a different friend now. So I'll see it again one day, but yeah, I totally know how comforting even a particular guitar can be, you know? Yeah. Um, so can you mentioned two books? Uh, can you share up to three? Uh, feel free to mention different ones or the same ones. Up to three inspiring books, films, or shows that you'd like to recommend to our listeners. And I would say in particular, you know, in light of the recent, you know, challenge, challenging period we've come through in the past however many months, it's been a year plus, you know, people might be feeling down, depressed or lost or whatever, so, something inspirational. It could be goofy, it could be fun, but, or deep, whatever. Well, I did, I write a couple of books, actually. Um, I told you I read Think Like a Monk. Um, one of the books that, it was very short read, but man, I will probably go back to it another dozen times this year wolf pack by um Addy, abby wombach mm -hmm. uh no but that was the i uh, one of my guests uh, two shows ago recommended wolf pack oh my gosh mm -hmm. started reading <laughs> it like I, I my sister had given it to me um, maybe a, two summers ago handed me the book and I'm like I got no time she's like just read it it's a very short read just read it and I put it on my shelf you know shelf help <laughs> put it on my <laughs> shelf right next to my my bed and um it was there like all year one Sunday I woke up and I was like you know like in this space of I don't want to get out of bed I just don't want to do anything like this is really hard I just picked up the book I could not put the book down I couldn't get out of bed until I finished the book. Oh. <laughs> it's like, I am stuck here for this book. Um, great book. Um, and then um, I picked up, my sister said another recommendation. She said, you like, you like the wolf pack? She goes, read Untamed, which is not written by Abby Wombach. It's written by her wife, Glenn Doyle. Mm -hmm. um, but Untamed was incredible as well. Uh, Glenn Doyle? Glennon. Glennon Doyle. Doyle. Yeah, I think I heard a podcast with Abby Wambach, but I, I don't remember the book. Uh, Think Like a Monk, Monk what's the uh, author on that one? Jay Shetty. Jay Shetty? Yeah. Uh, and uh, one of our listeners, uh, Darlene Carney, says that you get attached to your guitar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You totally do. I can't believe you gave it away again. That, that's one of my, my deep spiritual practices to, uh, it's called, um, in Japanese, it's called uh, Dan Shari. It's like this declutter lifestyle. Yeah. So you decluttered your best friend. <laughs> oh my God. If you have to, if you have to. <laughs> okay. I've decluttered best friends before. And actually I'm talking, I'm hanging out um, getting uh, hanging out with one tomorrow and speaking on uh, speaking with another one later in the day. So it, it worked. Decluttering them in the past worked so that, that we gave space for each other to come back into each other's lives. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so is that the three books you, you want to recommend? Was there anything else? Those are my three books um, that are standing out to me. If it, if it doesn't catch me, I don't finish the book. So like I'll start it and say, you know, like right now I'm, I'm reading Obama's uh, autobiography, latest autobiography. Um, but I got to the middle of the book and like, I want to, I want to finish it, but it's not urgent. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm the type of person who'll read, uh, I love reading. I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm an author as well. And uh, I'm a writer and I just want to get my inspiration from everywhere. So I do love finishing a book, but if I don't feel compelled to, I have no compunction, let it sit. Yep. You know, I fall, I actually, you know, I, I have own practice. So some books I, I try to go through, I get through in a month or something, but uh, especially Buddhist um, books that I study, I'll start pick up like a thousand plus page book and say, I'm going to read from cover to cover one page a day. And I just read it and fold it the next day. And I don't care if I understand it, I just read it. And uh, that's like this polishing of my, of my uh, inner soul. I don't, I don't know what you want to say. You know, it's, it's like I said, it's like taking a shower. I just feel sh uh, improved by it some, in some inexplicable way. But then I find that if I do that process again later, or I read the similar passage or, or the same passage somewhere else, I'm like, wow, I pretty much understand this. Or like, I'm just naturally speaking it, you know, effortlessly. So this peeling one page a day thing I do. And then, yeah, like Gandhi's autobiography I've been, I read and didn't finish it. I want to, but it's not urgent, you know, but some books, Anthony Kiedis's autobiography from Better Chili Peppers, that I had to finish quickly. That was like one of those books you don't want to put down. But again, I, I don't, I don't spend much time reading per day, but I do pretty much read every day. Uh, the Victor Wooten book, was that music lesson? Music lesson. Okay. And uh, as far as movies or TV shows, anything in particular? Uh, nothing that's standing out. Mm -hmm. I try not to, I mean, I find myself now watching more TV than I, I care to admit. I don't, prior to the pandemic, I would literally never watch television. Right. I would, you know, catch on YouTube the highlights to Dancing with the Stars because <laughs> I like mm -hmm. ballroom dancing, right? But never watch television. Never. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I hear you. Cool. Um, yeah, someone said, uh, Darlene says, you start to get it, I guess, in reference to reading page by page. Um, and uh, all right. So with that, if you'd like to share, um, what are your plans in the upcoming several months? If there's anything you want to mention, let us know about. Just preparing to return to normal. Praying we're still on track for that. Um, and I think that once we can get those kids in the building, sparks will be flying and nobody will be able to stop them. <laughs> so I'm really, that's what I'm, I'm mentally preparing for their return to normal to be epic. Wow. That's, that's so, so uh, encouraging to hear. Yeah. Great. So it's been super fun, Melissa. Uh, I can't believe uh, how quick that, close to two hours went. Um, yeah, so I will put this as an archive video on YouTube. I'll send you the link to this and the YouTube one, just so you have it. Um, feel free to share it if you like. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. I think we can, even though we went through all the questions, we got through them, we could do a part two one day down the line. It's just fun hanging out. Um, John, I'll hang out with you anyway. All right, cool. And since we're both community people, doing this is just naturally a fun way to invite our friends along. Or we could even have a bigger group. Who knows? Maybe four people on a Zoom call. That could be fun. You could do all your music teachers from when you were in, <laughs> when you were in, in high school. I'm game. You know, I uh, with uh, oh hey, hey Robert Rams is still there. Hold, hey. I was gonna say Robert. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say because one day I was talking. Was it when I was with? 
I don't know how, how it came up, but uh, somehow it was, you know, Jason and Robert Rams, Jason Hills and Robert Rams were, were in the comments section of a video, a live stream I was doing. And I said, to, you know, I, of course I had invited Jason on. He's a close friend. Uh, he hasn't took me up on it yet. He's got to find the right timing. But I said, yeah, and Robert too. Robert, Jason, it'd be great to have you. And of course, if we can get uh, Rebecca Wallow and Shona Howard together as well, more the merrier. Yeah. But uh, yeah, even if it's a few of us, whatever, I think it'd be fun. Mike Amaro would be good to get on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, it's like the way, the way I look at this podcast is um, in, when I was in high school, I was, uh, was kind of like a community leader in a way in my, my uh, neighborhood. So I had a basement uh, where my friends would hang out. My mother allowed us to hang out there. My band rehearsed down there. Um, it was kind of like a community center for lack of a better word. It was a, the central place. And I would invite a bunch of people. Some would say, yeah, I'll come and they don't show up and then others come. And they're, they're all connected through me and whoever shows up, they get to know each other and begin to vibe and, it, and this community grassroots community forms. Uh, and this is kind of my spirit. Like I, we can't do it in person these days. And it's not just because of the pandemic, it's just the reality of adult life, you know, and living f for far away, but to be able to have this space where mutual friends, people that I'm connected to can speak. Then maybe if we watch, if participants, guests watch the show and they say, Oh yeah, this guy is, or this girl is, I can relate to, then the communities, the bond forms. And then maybe like, like yeah, like we said, uh, multiple people on a show. I've done that a few times. It, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm, uh, I'm kind of going off here on my, uh, on a tangent. Um, did you learn about tangents in, in math class? Do you remember about tangents? <laughs> I told you, it wasn't community building. I don't, I don't remember much. Yeah, no. Yeah, I don't, I'm not a big believer in test taking myself, um, but. Uh, that's a whole different show. Yeah, that's a whole different show. So anyway, let, let's wrap up. And uh, thank you so much, much appreciation for being a part of this and uh, enjoy your summer, enjoy your time at the beach house and be well. And uh, take care, Melissa Mars. See you again. John Henry Sheridan, you rock. Yeah, you too. And thank you everybody for watching. Uh, until next time, signing out. Bye, everybody. Peace. Peace.